Hello, and welcome to Philosophy of the Barber. Today's guest, we have John Magyar. Uh, he has over 20 years worth of experience in law enforcement and was the owner of Faded Times Barbershop for five years in Swansea, New Hampshire, and sold it to Tom Irving. So it's now Irving Barbershop in Swansea. John, nice to see you. Yes, nice to see you. It's been a long time. I know. Thanks for having me. So I kind of want to uh, pick up from the beginning with you and tell me a little bit about your life before barbering. My life prior to barbering. Well, like you mentioned, for for 20 plus years, uh, just before I became a, a barber, I was in the public safety field. So I did that for a while. I uh, prior to that, um, well, I was in the military. Shout out to uh, us Air Force vets. Um, and I was, uh, you know, I, I was in the, in the Air Force for four years. And uh, I actually, that's really, when I think back, that's really where or when I began cutting was in the military. Um, I was tired of, uh, you gotta, you have to understand, I was, when I went in, it was all about, you know, us guys wanted the hair, you know. Uh, we liked, uh, the, the, the style was, you know, parted down the center and feathered back and all that. And You're going to have to divulge, like, what decade this was, Okay, John. all right. Well, <clears throat> I went in in 82, so, um, you know, you had to have the, the short military style haircut but you also wanted a little bit of you know a little bit of flair with a haircut and I found that the barbers on base just weren't they weren't cutting it you know uh, I would go there like many of the uh, the folks on on base were we were all getting kind of bad haircuts uh, if you had transportation and you could go off base well you could go get a decent haircut somewhere, but on base, it just wasn't happening. So what I did was I was at the BX one day and I came up upon a, just a pair of, you know, a cheap pair of clippers for sale. So I bought those and I started fixing my own haircuts. So I would go get a haircut and, uh, every, you had to get, you had to get a haircut every couple of weeks. So I would go get a haircut, come back and fix it. And it looked pretty good. I got pretty good at fixing what I considered mistakes, you know, or bad haircuts. And uh, one day, I remember this clearly, I was, out, I was out on base and a buddy of mine asked me, he said, hey, which barber gave you that haircut? And uh, there were two barbers in this particular barber shop on base. And I remember the good one, his name was Angel. I, re I remember it to, to this day. I mean, uh, I would only go to Angel, but Angel you know, it was hit or miss with him. So, um, he asked me which barber I went to. And I, I told him, well, this haircut, I actually gave myself as I did. I gave myself a full haircut. One day I got up and I just decided I'm not going to go. I'm just going to, I had fixed every part of my hair myself. So I figured I'll just give myself a haircut, a full haircut. And I told him that I said, well, and I was a little reluctant. I was kind of embarrassed to admit I was cutting my own hair. But uh, I told him, I said, I, I cut this myself. And he, he looked at me and he said, would you give me a haircut? And I thought, well, if I can cut my own hair, I could probably cut somebody else's hair. You know, I don't think it would be, I, it would probably be less difficult to do. So that's when I started giving haircuts. But uh, my interest in it, really, when I think back, my interest in it was, all right, now we're going back. This is something you don't even know about me. I, I've, you and I have been friends for a while, but I've never shared this. I, when, I was in, um, when I was in high school, again, this was the era, you know, we're talking late 70s, uh, early 80s. You know, everybody had longer hair than what you would see nowadays uh layered hair feathered you know i mean uh, that was the style back then you know john Trav everybody every guy out there whether they want to admit it or not they wanted to look like john travolta you know they wanted that hair so um i'm the oldest of five boys so you can imagine 
when I was growing up, my, my dad would take all five boys down to the barbershop and we would sit there and just get the, you know, the buzz cut. And I literally had that same haircut right up until I was in high school. And I didn't want that haircut, but we couldn't afford, you know, to go, I couldn't afford to go and get a really decent haircut at a salon. That's where you would go, you know, back in the eighties. I mean, if you wanted to you wanted to look like, you know, John Travolta. You had to go to a salon and get a haircut like that. So I couldn't afford to, uh, to do that. But I found a school. There was a school downtown in Haverhill um, where I grew up that, you know, you could go to for cheap money and, and get, a, get a, you know, a pretty decent haircut. So I started going there. And that's when I got out of that, you know, that buzz cut phase and I started growing my hair out a little more and I had interest in it. But what I, what I found was when I, I, I clearly remember watching the instructor talking with the student that was working on my hair. And that was fascinating to me. I, I just, I found it very interesting. And I remember, you know, watching that person section the hair and, you know, my hair and, and cut the hair according to the instructor. Then sometimes the instructor would walk away and I would see the student sort of fumbling with the comb and the shears. And I, I almost wanted to take the, the, the comb and shears from them and do it myself, you know. But um, that became really very, I, I don't know, I was fascinated by it. I, I just thought it was like really interesting. And, uh, and it stuck with me. Even the, like the techniques and, and, and things like that. I, I had never actually physically performed them, but I remember actually kind of learning the lessons along with the student. You know, I was paying attention, and, and it just uh, was fascinating to me. So that's really, I think, that was kind of the start of it for me. And when I started, I kind of, you know, forgot about that whole thing when I got into the military, but when I... You know, when I started cutting hair, all that kind of, I incorporated a lot of that, what I had seen and into those haircuts. And I, anyway, that's how, that's how it came about for me anyway. So what made you choose after you got out of the military to go directly into law enforcement as opposed to possibly going into the hair thing? That was is it a partially, really good question. Was it partially a perception of like career Differences? Yeah, it was definitely a perception. It was definitely a perception. I think, um, I, I don't know, I had in my mind that uh, it was probably a profession where I would not make a lot of money. And I don't know why I perceived it that way, but I, I just thought, well, you know, I was, again, to kind of back up, I've, I'm, I love art. And I love drawing and painting, and I've really never taken any lessons, but I can pick up a, a paintbrush, and I, I love to do oil paintings. I predominantly do, like, landscapes, things like that. And I just, I love art. And uh, I remember people in my family kind of steering me away from that, telling me, you know, you're not going to make any money in that doing this. You know, you should do something else. So I think that seed was planted whereby if I'm using my artistic abilities, I'm not going to make a lot of money. I think that was planted, that seed was planted early on. And that's kind of why I think I shied away from that. Um, you know, I was, I was right out of the military and uh, I, I did have a spark of interest in law enforcement while I was in the military. I actually volunteered to work with... Uh, the security police back then it was security police and LE you had SP and LE so security police and law enforcement and I was actually um, approached and asked if I would help uh, work with the security police um, for during a training exercise and they wanted me to infiltrate the flight line which I thought how cool is that you know I mean I was actually able to get right on the flight line, uh, which we were forbidden to do, and uh, get up close to, you know, an F-4 Phantom Fighter. And 
I, I just thought, well, this is going to be a once in a lifetime opportunity. I so, get to step over a red line. Oh yeah. Oh, that was definitely it. And I, in fact, um, as you know, you probably remember, uh, there were red circle painted around each aircraft. That's so we a, use boxes now. Okay. Well, this, you know, we're going back to the, <laughs> these were the olden days. Okay, Brie. Um, but there were these red circles around these planes and, you basically, you know, I don't know if this would be true or not, but we were told if you ever cross that line, you're, you know, you're probably going to be shot. So, I mean, we stayed away. You oh, know? yeah, you're done. So I remember asking um, the person that was organizing this training, I said, look, you know, if I get on the flight line, can I get to one of those planes? Would you let me cross that red line if I could, if I could get that close? And they, he said, oh, absolutely, you know, go for it. I said, all right. Well, I thought, you know, I, I'm a young guy at the time, and I was in really good shape. And I remember them dropping me off at the end of the flight line. And um, everybody out there knew that there was an exercise going on. And ba it was basically to test the security of the flight line. And I remember crawling basically on my belly through the weeds, getting up as close as I could to one of the planes. And then I thought, I'm just going to get up and go. I mean, I, I, I could run like a deer back then. So I thought, I'm going to, I'm definitely getting to the plane. My goal was to actually touch the plane. That's what I wanted to do. Because I mean, what a great story, right? You go back to the barracks and share this. So yeah, so I, uh, I got to the point where I thought I can get up and I'm going to be able to do this. And I remember taking three steps onto the flight line and a voice from the heavens coming over some speaker, you know, they described, they said, you stop where you are. And they described what I was wearing, you know, hands, hands to your uh, hands above your head and, you know, spread your legs. And next thing I, they told me to turn around. So I couldn't see what was coming, but I could hear it. And it sounded like, you know, an army of people running, approaching me and, Boom, I was on the ground and in handcuffs before I knew it. And uh, there were people standing all around. And I thought, I want to be a part of that. I mean, I was amazed at how they all worked together as a unit. You know, I thought that was, that was really neat. And uh, anyway, when I got out, I pursued a career in law enforcement. But that's kind of what sparked that. And uh, anyway, that was it. So what finally, like, clicked with you to, to, to finally leave law enforcement and then pursue uh, the, the buried passion that you had for, for hair and, and for barbering? Excellent, excellent question. Well, for years, the job, I really did love the job. Um, very stressful kind of a job. And I quickly rose through the, the ranks. I became a lieutenant as a police officer. And uh, I left there really because I was missing a lot of, you know, I had two young boys at the time and I was missing ball games and things like that. So I left law enforcement basically for family reasons, just for a better, a better way of life. And I was offered, offered a job working at a, a private school as a safety ops manager. Um, it was actually better pay, better hours. You know, I had weekends off. It was a dream come true. So I, I jumped at the chance. I took the job. And for the first, you know, five years, it was, it was pretty decent. And then it, it just became more and more... Um, stressful, a little more difficult, a little more challenging. And <clears throat> not that I wasn't up for that, but I, I started thinking about doing something else. And I, I just kept coming back to barbering. I mean, this entire time I had been cutting hair, my boy's hair, for example, friends and family, um, in my basement with a, you know, an old, just an old pair of clippers and and I would always think about doing it, but it wasn't, and I would talk about it a lot with my wife. I told her that if I couldn't do it now, that I would, I was definitely going to do this when I retired. That was going to be really my retirement job. But deep down inside, I really wanted to do it like right now, you know, I, want, I, I wanted to do it right away. So, uh, and it was just by chance, I mean, you, have, I, you and I have talked about, like, I, I believe things happen for a reason. And uh, certain, I've had enough experiences in my life where I'm like, you know what, this is just more than coincidence, you know. But I remember clearly one night I was sitting 
at home. It was after work. And uh, on came Chronicle, uh, you know, New Hampshire Chronicle, and, and a show on television. And they were um, highlighting the school, the New England School of Barbering. And I remember hauling, hauling to my wife, you've got to get in here. This is exactly what I want to do. This is what I've been talking about. I had never heard of the school before. I never really searched for it or ser searched for a school like that. But when I saw that school on television, I, it was exactly what I was looking for. And uh, I had made the decision that day that I was going to go to the school and uh, check it out. And I did. I called the school. They were very welcoming. They said, hey, come up whenever you want. We'll give you a tour. You know, we'll talk to you about the profession. And uh, I went up there and I met Dave Karen, and, uh, who is now, a, I consider him a, a great friend. And um, man, it was everything I was looking for. And I decided, uh, you know, to leave my job uh, that I had been at for over 13 years and pursue this as a as a career you know and uh it, it was terrifying it was scary and i'll tell you if it wasn't for my wife um super super supportive and uh we figured out whether or not we could swing it financially and and uh yeah i mean everything kind of fell in place and i was able to do it and I'm so grateful for that, you know. So did you, like, check out other schools before you uh, checked out New England School of Barbering? No, no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't even look for other schools. I, I knew that, you know, there were, without naming names, I mean, you know, you've got your typical run-of-the-mill... Uh, um, oh, we name names. Empire, okay. Well, Michaels, Empire, you know. pretty yeah, much the only all, games All those in schools town. out there. And uh, quite honestly, I didn't want to get into the cosmetology end of things. At least I didn't think I wanted to back then. Um, I do have an interest in it now. Sure. But uh, as a barber, I, uh, I mean, I'm a master barber, but, you know, I find myself sometimes if I go to like a, uh, a hair show or something, I remember being at one hair show, which was kind of a combination of barber and cosmetology. And uh, I remember I was watching a platform artist on stage doing this crazy long haircut i mean it was on on this uh, woman and at one point i i kind of like looked around me and i was literally the only dude standing in a sea of you know 20, 20 something year old women but for me i wanted to know that you know i wanted to it was interesting to me so well i feel like once you've reached a certain point in the barbering profession it's Going to barbering shows really doesn't do anything for people who have been in the industry for a while because we continue to want to learn more and to grow. Right. And really the way that we can find that is to go outside of the barbering profession to see what cosmetologists do because that's not something we're familiar with. And right, that's where right. we can continue to grow. Yeah, I, I, I would totally agree with that. I, yeah, for me, it was something it was I was learning something new, you know, and or seeing something new and I wanted to understand it a little better. So. Um, but anyway, I got off track. I, what was I saying? The, um, schools. Yeah. So the schools, yeah, I didn't want that. At least I didn't think I wanted that type of education. I wanted to be a barber. You, you know? wanted the straight razor. And I wanted the straight the razor. Yeah. You know, I wanted the, uh, I just wanted to, I, I wanted to be a barber and I wanted to give at the, again, at the time I was thinking my customer base would be predominantly male. And, uh, you know, I would give those, I would give men haircuts and give manly haircuts and things like that. But it wasn't until I got into it that I really realized that, you know, I don't care if I'm cutting a guy's head or a, you know, head of hair or, or, or a woman's head of hair or kids or, you know, old, young, it didn't matter to me. You know, it was just... It was, it, was, it was the whole process of doing that, you know, of, of giving somebody that haircut that they want, that certain style they're looking for, and making them happy. Didn't matter to me, you know? Well, because it's just a canvas, and whoever decides to wear that canvas, exactly. I mean, that's up to yeah, them. Yeah, and I mean, you know, the people you meet, too, they're so interesting. And if, you, you know, if you're talking to guys all day long that are, 
you know, either in the military or in law enforcement or they're, you know, if that's all you're attracting, you're kind of missing, I think, the big picture. You know, there, I've learned so much in the past five years doing this, five plus years of having my shop. Um, yeah, I mean, I've learned, gosh, I've learned so much from different people, you know, people that I thought I would never talk to, really, you know. Like I wouldn't have anything in common with this person, but they're coming to me for something. And, you know, once you get them in the chair and you start talking to them, it's just interesting, you know, to learn about people. Well, and I was talking to Corey um, Holt from a previous episode, and we kind of got on the subject of, you know, people come to you initially to get a haircut, but they keep coming back to you for you, for who you are, hmm. and for the experience that they get when they're in your chair. You know, you can always grow in developing the haircut that they want but if they connect with you they're willing to they're open to you and they're willing to give you another chance right so it's kind of the same way on the barber's end where you have to be open to allow anybody in your chair so that you can open yourself up to learning to having an experience to trying something new right right because yeah. otherwise you're denying yourself the ability to grow oh yeah no i i, I would agree I, I don't know. For me, I, I just I just loved it. Um, I, you know, one thing I remember. I remember a customer once saying to me, uh, "I hadn't seen this person for about a four four weeks, about a month." Person came back in, and we started having a conversation about what we were talking about. You know, last time that person was in, and he stopped and he looked at me and he said, "How do you remember that?" Like I was remembering the previous conversation and I said, well, I don't know. We were just talking about it a month ago and I just, but then I realized like I, I couldn't tell you what I had for breakfast yesterday, but I could remember, I remember the conversations I'm having with my customers. And it was because I think if you genuinely enjoy the people you're, you're dealing with, I think you're going to remember those things. You know, you, I know guys used to write things down about each customer and let, keep little cards and things like that. I never had to do that. And uh, I'm grateful for that. I don't have a, I wouldn't say my memory is any better than the next person's, but um, of course my wife would tell you I have a really bad memory. <laughs> but, um, it's selective. Yeah, it's sele exactly. But, you know, when it came to conversations with customers, um, and I think that's important, you know, if you, if you really try not to only enjoy the art of what you're doing, but enjoy the people you're talking to, you know? It's just, it's so cool. Well, I think the, on the memory end of things, like we all, unless you are an elephant, we all struggle when it comes to remembering names at first. Mm. But we are far more likely to remember your haircut and what we talked about. Exactly. Than we are anything else. Yeah, I'm terrible with names too. I'm terrible with names, but. But the, the longer you foster that relationship and grow it and cultivate it, the, the more it's like, all right. And it's the visual, like when you see the name, if you have appointments or whatever, right. you know, it's right. reinforcing. If you're friends with them on Facebook, you see it all the time and then you'll remember who they are. But we tend to remember people right off the bat with like, if we have, you know, 20 different mics. So we have to differentiate when we talk about them to other barbers that are in the shop going, all right, well, which mic are you talking about? Exactly. And then we describe their haircut right, or right. what they do. Right. Right. Cause last names, I mean, that's hard, right. <laughs> but it, it's, it's their description, their visual description, because this is such a visual job. Hmm. And then also the connection that you made while talking with them, because other barbers, if they've sat in their chair, would also have that basic connection. So that's like how we determine who you are in our little circle. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it, it, it's interesting. It, you talk about, you know, visual being, you know, looking at somebody's hair and it's also their head, you know, <laughs> you get to know people's heads. <laughs> it's kind of funny, but you know, their hair, their hair type, what, you know, whether or not they have a mole in a certain spot or yeah, a, skin conditions. a cowlick somewhere or something. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's interesting. Um, the guy that comes in with that same product in his hair every time and never washes it before he comes to see you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We, that's a whole nother, we could do a whole nother show on, Maybe well, things that irritate barbers. <laughs> yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. But, uh, yeah. 
Anyway, no, I've just enjoyed it. I've, I've really, uh, I had to sell my shop um, about a year ago. I sold it to to move to the East Coast uh, for family reasons. I had to do that. And, uh, of course, I got here. I thought it was going to be very easy to open up a shop here. And I quickly found out that that, that was a challenge. So There is a bubble on the seacoast of New Hampshire. Yeah, I would say so. Uh, it, it's really saturated, I think, with barber shops and salons and... Uh, it's been it's been a struggle. So you know, in my quest to open up a shop, which is really what I want to do, I, I have been offered jobs working in other shops, but I I really I so enjoyed having my my own shop. Um, I really you know I it killed me to to sell it, but I was so happy to sell it to somebody, a young guy by the name of Tom Irving, who's a great barber and. Uh, even a better person, and um, he's running that shop right now under his his name, and he's doing a great job with it. And I, I could not have asked for a better person to take over the shop. So, you know, it, it's a it's really not a sad story, but uh, it did it. It broke my heart to sell that shop, and I created it from nothing. There was not a shop there; it was an empty room, and to you know, have that vision and build that and then have to leave it. It, it was, it was tough. And I, I thought, oh, I can do this because I can recreate it. But it, it's almost like, you know, leaving a child or, <laughs> you know, it's, it was hard. It was really hard. Well, it's a little bit of magic. Like you, when you find a space that was not a shop before and you can immediately envision what you're going to do with it, that's, that's a little spark of magic mm. that mm. you just stumble upon. Right. Like, right. that's not something you can manufacture and replicate. Right. And, you know, you, you kind of remind me of another, another thing that I think is great. Uh, it's a great tool to have as a barber is the ability to visualize. I think that's... It's huge. Yeah, it's huge. And, you know, not everyone can do that. Um, it, you know, we can get into a whole other conversation about... I, I personally think, and we may have a difference on this, but I think... If you have a bit of artistic ability within you, um, I think it translates into being a better barber. And I know, I think Dave Karen would argue that with me, my instructor, because of course he's he's in the business of ins you know educating. He, well, he claims he can teach anybody to do this, and I believe he can. It's but. a learned trade, is is what he's always saying. But I, I agree with you in because. I mean, if we look at the the old textbooks, uh, you know, L. Sherman Trustee Publications, it's it's called the Art and Science of Barbering mm. because it's really a mesh of the two. Like right. there is some art involved, especially today when you're dealing with like less of the the average barber and more into the design aspect of things, more of the urban end where it's you know looking for actual artistic ability on the side of somebody's head, mm. where you are phenomenal. And nobody would really peg you for that just because you don't really meet the, the general expectation of a description of a barber who would be able to do that. Right. Uh, but yeah, I don't look, I know the audience can't see me, but I, I don't look like somebody that could do what I do. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, a, yeah, oh, hey, I'm 56 years old right now. I've got gray hair and, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't look like your typical young barber, you know, that you may have in your mind, uh, that, that image. I used to have people, I used to have young guys, I say young, you know, early twenties pop into my shop and stick their head around the corner and look at me. And you, you've got to know I'm the only barber in my shop. I've, I've always worked by myself in my shop and, uh, they'd peek their head around the corner and they'd say, yo man, uh, is John working today? And I'd look back and I'd say, I'm John. And they'd say, Oh, because <laughs> they weren't, you know, and They're I get expecting it. a young guy. They were expecting somebody, you know, probably tattooed up and young and, you know. Well, I think it's, it's a direct expectation that somebody who would wear a certain style would be the person to be able to give that certain style. Yeah. Just like somebody who can cut uh, ethnic hair or textured hair. Right. Right. Whatever you want to call it. Um, there is an expectation that that person has to have that type of hair in order to know how to cut it. Sure. That's not the case. That's not the case. So no. there, it, it, there's that perception issue again that's like, oh, if you have a quality person in any profession, they don't look a certain way. Right. 
Right. You know, uh, Dave used to, my instructor, used to tell me, you will attract people like yourself to your barbershop. And he was right to a certain, you know, to a certain degree because once you start turning out haircuts or designs, I used to do designs, uh, you know, hair tattoos people call them too. And uh, I used to turn those out. Well, all your work is out there. It's like a billboard for your shop, you know. And people say, yo, would you get that? Somebody says, oh, go to Faded Times. John, John can do this for you. And they show up. I don't think they're expecting me, you know, because I, let's face it, I did some crazy stuff and I, I'm proud of it. I love it. But, <laughs> and it's funny too, you talk about the, the stuff. I, I mean, I, again, I used to do things with um, designs with some color and different crazy things. And it, it was funny because when my kids were growing up, they always wanted a little something edgy and I, I would forbid them to have that. You know, because uh, I know, and I feel bad now. I feel like I've robbed them of that because now I'm doing it. It seems to be, you know, every other haircut I'm doing Remorse something. Remorse of a father. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's you know, and I, I would, I remember another barber telling me, um, I was so proud to tell, you know, my friends, hey, my kids have never been to a barber shop. I've always cut their hair. And one of the students, one of the guys I went to school with turned to me once and said, you've robbed them of that experience. And I felt terrible because for a second I thought, oh, yeah, you're right. I did, <laughs> you know, but they've never had that opportunity as a kid to go to a barbershop, you know, and smell the lather and the, the cologne and the experience of being there and hear the conversation. They, they didn't have that. But, oh, well, I can't go. I can't go back. I feel like conversely, they had a little bit of extra quality time with their dad. Oh, thank you, Bree. That's you're a welcome. good way to look at it. There's thank a you. silver lining to everything. Yes, John. yes, yes. Uh, you're right. Well, now... Uh, where I've, I, I have sold a shop, my son who lives in Keene is actually going to Tom and he's having to open his wallet now and pay for a haircut, which he's, he, he's never had to do. So, um, you won't drive all the way down to the seacoast. No, 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 no. And I've, you know, I've put the clippers aside for a bit. Um, I will most likely pursue once we get through this whole, you know, COVID-19 and, uh, Man, my heart goes out to people that are like yourself that are actually, I mean, I, you know, I was out of the business when this whole thing happened. Um, but for folks that have shops that are doing it, Hey, I feel you, you know, that it's, it's tough. And I, my heart goes out to everybody out there. That's, uh, you know, trying to make ends meet or just now opening up. I mean, it's, it's tough. It's been tough. And uh, I've been keeping tabs with certain people and, uh, yeah, it's, Man, I don't even know what to say. That's who who would have thought, right? Well, it's crazy. Taking a step back and not being so personal of perspective. I mean, I remember one of the big sales pitches of entering this profession was it's recession proof. But nobody mm. ever says anything about pandemics. Nobody ever thought of something. I mean, you couldn't you really couldn't have dream this up, although it's happened before, right? I mean, In I'm history. sure a think tank could have brought it up, but Yeah, right, right. You know, we're not crazy. we're not geniuses in a room no, together. No, we just want to cut hair, you know. But I will tell you, it's funny because I've been out of the business now for just over a year. I've kept my Facebook page up though, so I can have contact with my customer base and um, their friends, and I like to, you know, just stay in touch with them. It's the only Facebook page I I know, Bree. Don't you know? It's the only it's the only social media page that I'm involved in right now as far as you know being able to you do what you gotta do I know I just don't have I'm my not own gonna page throw or, any judgment I know. no shade right. but anyway so I, ha I had my page open and um you know Facebook as you know is a if it's a business page they let you know how many views you're getting this and that boy did I see an uptick in views and people reaching out to me uh and I'm not even open I don't even you know but these are former customers and in and just general people out there, hey, where can I go to get a haircut like this? Or is there anything I can do now that I'm, I can't get a haircut? You know, what, what can I, I mean, it's been, it's really been eye-opening, you know? But you, people at, at a time like this, you, you really, you, you understand, I think, as a customer, just how valuable the barber is. Well, and I think that, I mean, right now we're kind of, we're living 
month to month, like from a, a memory standpoint, like can, I don't know about you, but I can't remember exactly what was going on before COVID happened and the quarantine started. Mm. Like I know that things happened, but I can't tell you exactly when, like we got a new couch at the shop (laughs) this year, but I can't tell you when we got it. Right. Right. So I think quarantine's kind of like that right now for us. We're like, you know, opened up, stay at home order, like revisions and, you know, uh, restrictions slowly being lifted. But so quarantine, like that two month period is now kind of like that. Like I remember things that happened, Mm. but I can't necessarily always remember in what order. Right. So there were parts where, you know, customers were fantastic. They're reaching out wondering, you know, what they can do, buying e-gift cards, uh, you know, Square has been phenomenal letting us open uh, online stores during that with a lot of uh, different features being rolled out that they didn't have before. Like, if you work with Square, they're phenomenal. And I'm sure other companies uh, opened up those stores for a lot of their That's patrons. Great. That's great. Uh, but the, I think one of the highlights was really seeing how supportive the community is if you've grown a good shop and have a solid customer base as how much they care about you as a person and want to make sure you're okay right and most people in fact you know other than getting e-gift cards which they're happy to use whenever some of them are even like i don't even want to use it like give it to somebody who needs it Mm. which we're happy to do uh it's really like reaching out they don't want to buy a product they just want to help you so, and I'm not somebody personally to, to ask for a handout. Like, oh, I, I have a little that. too much pride for that. that. Right, right. Personally. Um, so I, I'm always willing to like, hey, if you want to buy a product, buy a t-shirt, like buy anything retail to help us out, by all means, go for it. But I'm never going to just like ask for a handout with nothing to give you in return. Right. But out of all of the people reaching out and wanting to know how they can help by the virtue of the traffic, like putting up a... Uh, hey, if you don't want to buy anything, but you still want to help, you know, you can add a donation button. And so people took advantage of that. And that was so heartwarming. That's a great idea. And, yeah. you know, splitting everything with my barbers because we're all in the same boat. That's great. I mean, that's great. You, Yeah, that's that's a that's a great thing to do, I think, you know. And I'm, I'm kind of surprised at how many customers as we're coming back really like are wondering all right so did did everybody come back like do you have all of your barbers right like they're expecting that somebody might drop off here or there yeah but like we stuck together as you know a team and as a family like we kept in contact we wanted to justin had a baby during the quarantine Wow. um harvard was finishing up his semester in college like we wanted to make sure that everybody was was good to go yeah hey you're a family you know it's all it really is it's the, the whole barbering community i i view it as a family um, yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, that, that was another thing, the, the network of barbers around, cause you can compete if you want to call it that, but you can all win in this kind of thing if you're doing it right. But, um, reaching out to other barbers going, Hey, do you, do you have a glove contact? Cause some of these things were hard to get PPE. Oh, to I can reopen. imagine. Yeah. Going, I was hey, trying to keep my, my, you know, my finger on the pollster in this to try to, you know, see just, I was concerned about, you know, folks like yourself and I, and other friends I have in the business. And even though I, I didn't have my shop and had those struggles, I, I was trying to see what was going on, you know, from a, a business perspective. And, and yeah, I know PPE was tough to get. Sure. Uh, and know, sanitizer, things like that. It was great having fellow barbers, you know, reach out going, you know, sending links to, to places going, all right, you can get masks here. Uh, you know, sending links going, hey, this is a phenomenal contact. You'll get like in four days, you'll get your order of gloves. Um, capes, man, capes were worse than toilet paper. Right, right. Well, I think the whole idea behind that is folks were having to really, you know, you've got to wash them, right? In between. Is that what they're yeah, recommending? Between every customer. So right. we had to like up our cape right, count. Right. Right. So, so that capes was, became valuable. Oh yeah. So wow. thank goodness for wholesale accounts who like actually make capes. Right. Awesome. Because those were the only places that I could find them that weren't like price gouging, and that you actually knew when you get your order. So how is it now though? Do you feel like you have enough 
Do you have enough supplies now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we have plenty of supplies. Um, I was fortunate personally, like just by virtue of owning a six tier shop is I had like a case of Barbicide concentrate on hand. Right. And more right. so than right. I was willing to like uh, give it to another barber and, you know, give him a case of gloves or whatever. So it wasn't like toilet paper for you. you no. <laughs> In fact, we still have toilet paper from before yeah. COVID. <laughs> well, yeah, you need to have that too, right? Oh, wow. Gosh. So we were very fortunate on a number of fronts. Yeah, well, that's um, good. That's great. And not everybody is necessarily so lucky. But to have that network and to be open enough to talk to other barbers, because some people are like, oh, you know, there's another barber in town. We don't talk. We're like, because mm. they're competing for the same people. But it's like, you're all in a boat with a hole in it. Like, you might have different boats, but you both got holes. Right. So if you can help each other, that'd be great. Mm. So that's how I look at it is like, hey, like, if I'm struggling... That means you're probably struggling. Right. So right. if yeah, you I can help, help each I'm other willing. out. I mean, you know, it's uh, it's just the way it is. Yeah. I, I never felt like when I had my shop, I never felt like I was in competition with another shop. I never felt that way. I always felt like, you know, it, we, and we were all friends. I mean, you know, the people that were around me and uh, around my shop and uh, we were all very very friendly with one another. We would, we would actually send, we were talking about this earlier, we would send customers, you know, back and forth and things like that if we were too busy and, and uh, you know, it went both ways. So, yeah, it's a family, it really is. Well, and I think it's kind of like dealing with a downtown merchant uh, community. Like you have the mindset that, you know, because it's typically owner-operated, like, it's your business. You're going to run it the way you want to run it. Very, very independent. Mm. Um, and barbers are very much the same way because one of the, the perks of being in the profession is that you can be your own boss and, you know, run your own destiny. So I think there is something to be said when people can put those independent compulsions aside for a little bit and, and look past you and go a little bit broader and go, all right, we have camaraderie in our love of this profession, which is one of the reasons what's great about the podcast is that like I get to talk to barbers with so many different backgrounds. Yes, that definitely. We may disagree on a lot of different subjects, whether it's politically or morally or whatever business, like our philosophies on how we run things, but we we come together in the common uh, ground of loving the profession, right, and having a passion for it, right, right. And I I think it makes it that much more interesting because, you know, folks do, they do have different views on things, different backgrounds, you know, but you all have that one common, you know, denominator. you're, You're all, you all have that same interest, you know, in barbering, and that's what pulls everybody together. But it makes it that much more interesting, I think, when you've got all these different people, you know, from different cultures and different, you know, I, I just found it. I don't know. I love it. Well, I think it extends just as much as how diverse and eclectic your clientele is Mm. as much as it is how diverse and eclectic your barber network is, is that you're open to hearing and understanding people from different perspectives. Sure. And that helps you grow as a person, like as a whole across the board, like these types of things that you learn transcend any profession. Right. That's right. just being a human. Yeah. You know, I had a, uh, I had a, a customer once. Um, it was a woman, young, young woman, early 20s. She came up the stairs to my shop, poked her head in the door, and she said, uh, hey, can I ask a question? And I said, what's that? She said, uh, do you cut women's hair? And I said, you got money in your pocket? <laughs> I said, I'll cut anybody's hair, you know? It doesn't matter to me. I mean... You want a haircut, come on in, you know. But I found out, I got talking to her, and she was coming from another shop, not too far from mine, and they only cut men's hair. And they actually turned her away. And I just, I I was floored by that. I was just floored by that. Um, I would never turn anyone away. I don't care who they are, you know. Um, Yeah, that just, that was crazy to me. And I only had one customer, one male customer, um, I had finished up a, a cutting a woman's hair 
and she left, and this person got in the chair and complained about the fact that I allowed women in my shop. And I stopped and I said, look, I said, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know what you thought the shop was all about, but I don't care who comes through the door. You know, if they want a haircut and they're respectful in here of me and my shop and they're welcome, you know? Uh, yeah. He, I didn't think I would see him again, but he came back, <laughs> you know? So. Well, I think sometimes that's, it's a matter of educating people. Now, it's the person's decision whether or not they want to learn the lesson you're, you're offering them. Mm. So that was really his choice to make is, all right, am I going to go back to that shop? Yeah, or he was am an I older not? gentleman, and I think he, he was kind of, he had, a, he had an idea of uh, what the barbershop was like. Sure. And, you know, I mean, some of, you know, I don't want to peg just the older generation, but I, I find a lot of the older men think it's okay to tell, you know, an off-color joke or whatever. But the thing is, look, hey, I've been around. I mean, we were in the military. I, I know how it is, you know, and, and sometimes locker talk goes on and everything, and I'm not, I'm not condoning it. I certainly don't condone it in my shop. But, um, you know, I think, and this, again, we can start, this goes off in a whole other uh, area of conversation is, you know, controlling conversation in the barbershop and doing things the way you want to do it. But, you know, I, I didn't allow any of that. I was just, you know, I, I would put a stop to it and uh, in, in a nice way, you know, I'd tell him, hey, you know, we don't talk like that in here or, you know, and you got to remember I was right near a college too. So we would have, you know, sometimes I'd get three or four guys coming in, all friends, you know, from the college and they want to talk about their night on the town last night. And I've got, you know, a mom and a, and a little boy waiting for a haircut in my shop. So, you, you know, as, as, a, as a business owner, we have, to, we have to control the conversation sometimes in there and, and put a stop to things that, you know, may be inappropriate. Um, I just didn't allow that kind of stuff in my shop because I viewed my shop as a family shop. And it was, uh, it was a shop for, for everyone. I didn't want anyone feeling offended if they were coming to my shop. So, right. you know, save it for... Another time, guys, you know, I, I, I would tell them, but, um, yeah. Well, yeah. and I think that, uh, it's, it's our job, not only as shop owners, but as barbers to, we have that responsibility to control the conversation mm. because we are really the driver of it. Right. You know, we, we can, we can control whether we reply right. to it, whether we encourage it, whether we discourage it. It's our bus. You can get on and get off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And guess what? We're the one with sharp objects. So <laughs> that's right. That's right. That little subconscious thing in the back of the customer's mind going right, right. They have scissors. That's right. Next to my ear. <laughs> yeah. Accidents do happen. Yeah. That's why we have insurance. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it's, that's part of wanting to be inclusive and being open to everyone is really creating that environment that is welcoming to all. Right. And there are the shops, there are plenty of shops that are welcome feeling to a specific clientele. Right. There's a specific type of person that feels very comfortable in that environment, and there are people that don't. Mm. Um, and it's not to say that that's wrong no, or no, no. I, that it shouldn't exist, but it's right. It's setting yourself up for what your goal is. Right. It, it, the, in the, but the one thing, and, and again, if that's the type of shop you want, you, want, you only want to attract a certain demographic or whatever, hey, so be it. Um, I'm not knocking that. I just say, for me... Uh, that's not the way I operated my shop. And I also viewed it as if, um, I don't want to turn, I, you know, if you're turning away somebody, you're turning away that money as well. You know, you're limiting your, your, the, the funds that you could be potentially bringing in. So, um, I think it's kind of, I think you're, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot, so to speak. You know, if you, if you start yeah, you're cutting excluding your paycheck, people, you know, short. Yeah. Yeah. But, and I think that, um, Corey and I had covered this with our earlier conversation that the whole, like turning away certain haircuts, long hair or, you know, um, textured hair, whatever type of hair that you were uncomfortable with, like being honest with the customer while still being open with them is like, look, I'm totally willing to cut your hair. But I will be honest and let you know that I don't have a lot of experience with this type. If you're willing to work with me and be patient with me till we can get what you want, 
then I'm willing to work with you. Absolutely. And that's a mutual thing that has to occur. So making that known is not a bad thing. No, not at all. Like totally shutting that out so that you'll never grow and never learn that. That's robbing yourself of future income as well as a learning experience. Right. I totally agree with that. I, I think the worst mistake you can say, and I mean, I've heard this time and time again from people that have come to my shop to have things corrected or fixed uh, they would say, I went to this shop, I asked for, you know, X, Y, Z, and this is what I got. And the person would tell them, they would say, hey, I would like my hair like this. Can you do this? And the barber or stylist would say, oh, yeah, absolutely, I can do that. And then have no clue. I mean, it was clear to me by looking at what they did to that person's head that they didn't know what they were doing you know they said that they could do something that they they clearly didn't have the skills so I think by being up front right if you don't have the skills uh, in that certain area because let's face it we're all strong and, and weak in, in different areas as barbers um, if if you don't feel comfortable doing it I think you need to you know just don't say oh I can do that and uh you know, give it your best because sometimes if you're, if you're not, if you're not up to par there, it could be, it could be a disaster. Um, then they may be coming somewhere, you know, going somewhere else to get their, their hair fixed. Well, and then there has to be that desire to hone one's skill where if you don't have a certain type of hair coming through your door in a shop, so you're not getting that experience with a certain type of hair, I think it's the responsibility of the barber to seek out those people, like put out, hey, I'm going to give free haircuts to anybody who has this type of hair Mm. because I want to learn. Right, right. So create those opportunities for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I think what I did, what I would do is if I had, uh, if there was a a textured hair or uh, somebody was asking for something that I wasn't doing every single day, um, I would... I think, number one, take your time, you know. Uh, I know you're probably in a shop and you want to turn out haircuts, you know, as as fast as possible, but really take the time, you know. The old saying is, you know, once you... Once you cut it a certain length, you know, it's it's not getting any longer. So just take your time with it. And uh, that's really the best advice I could give with, you know somebody that might be struggling is just just take your time look at what you're doing step away from it take a look at it look at it in the mirror from a distance and uh and just and just kind of go with it and you can let them know hey look I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna take my time on this because it's something that i haven't done uh you know a whole lot and they would i i i found that my customers or they would respect that you know oh yeah and i think any reasonable person will give you um, some buffer time, especially mm. if you're up front with uh, your experience level. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, up to a certain point. Up it's to the, a point. Right. You know, if you're rocking two hours and their butt's falling asleep twice, it's like, right, all right, right, mm, right. We need to like cut the short. I've yeah. got dinner. If to you plan. see that coming, I think that's, you know, prior to picking up the shears, just tell them, hey, I'm just not, it's out of my wheelhouse right now, you know. I'm, but again, you know, that goes back to training, right? And, 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 uh, Getting as much education as you can, you know, take classes. Another thing you can do is buddy up with another barber that has that crazy skill, you know. Um, I'm not going to mention this barber shop, but I actually get a phone call from a barber who was struggling with uh, fades and just didn't, wasn't doing a, a whole lot, particularly bald fades, and uh, asked for some help. Yeah, I said, absolutely. I packed up my tools. And I said, if you can bring in, give me, you know, three or four customers, have them lined up and we'll do them. I'll show you how to do them. You know, we can practice and, or you can practice and, you know, watch me. And yeah, I did that one day, a whole afternoon, just teaching. And, you know, I think any, any barber uh, out there would be willing to help, you know, especially if they're a friend, if you know them already, you know, they're from the area. I, I, I think they'd be more than happy to help you. Or even just like somebody who's common in the profession and they're willing to display the humility to ask for help. Yeah, yeah. Just by virtue of that, I think you earn immediate respect and go, yeah, like if you're willing to ask for help, 
Sure. I mean, I'll let's face it. With we don't, we don't know it all. There's, there's not one barber out there. I don't care how sick they say their skills are. There's not one barber out there that knows it all. That is good in every single aspect of, you know, they, they may talk the talk, but look, let's face it. We, we're all, we all have our strengths, but we're all weak in a certain area. Some of us in many areas, but it, it's something that if you have the desire, I do believe you can, you can actually you know, you can hone that skill. You can hone it, you know, and, and do, don't shy away. If you're a student in barber school right now, don't shy away. Don't be the person that runs to the bathroom or runs in the back room or whatever. When, uh, you know, a, a customer comes through the door with a head of hair that you don't want to cut because you're just terrified to cut that hair. You know, um, I'll tell you, I wanted to do, uh, my, I, I was struggling for some reason with, um, Shiro of a comb when I was in school and flat tops. And I remember telling Dave Karen, this is what I feel like I need help with. And I want, if you can, I said, I, I want to be fair about this, but if a flat top comes through that door and nobody wants it or nobody's up for, for the flat top, I, I said, I don't care if I'm in the back room eating lunch, call my name and I will come out. And do you know I was about two bites into a sandwich one day, honestly, and he, sh he hollered my name, and I knew, oh, a flat top or shear and comb, uh, shear over comb, just walked through the door. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, practice it because uh, that's the only way you're going you're gonna to get better, you well, know. And you will get better. You will. And what I've told the students recently um, to try and keep in mind, and they told me last week that I hear, I hear it in the back of my head, which is um, lean into the suck. Like that thing that you are avoiding, the thing that scares you the most, you're in school, which means there's a safety net. Mm. So now is the time to push yourself. If you right. fall, you'll be caught. You'll be right. fine. Right. Uh, so lean into the suck. Don't fall into it because it gets real sticky down there, but mm. just lean into it and you'll you'll come out a lot better because you'll have faced that fear. You'll have... You know, tackled it. You'll have most likely learn something new after that haircut. Whether it's that person is really, really cool, or you picked up a technique that finally clicked in your head. Yeah. Like something good will come out of that. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Don't shy away for sure. You know, absolutely. You, you know, we can all we can all get better. We can all you know uh, hone our skills, and uh, yeah, it's important. Tackle those things you're afraid of. You know. And like you say, while you're in school, that's the time to do it. I remember week one in school. I was there literally one week, and there was a student, I don't even remember this person's name, they were graduating like next week. You know, they, they had, he, this person had already gone through the program, and he was the terror on this guy's face because it, it finally sunk in that he was done. And, you know, the instructors were not going to be standing by his side when he was working on a head of hair. He was going to be out there on his own. And I remember the look on that guy's face, and I thought to myself, that is not going to be me, you know, down the road when I graduate. So I, I think that, that terrified me, seeing him and realizing how nervous he was leaving. And I thought, I don't want that to be me. So I, I really, uh, I don't know if you remember or not, but I, I remember even taking my lunch breaks, and I would go to the, uh, the video library and grab you know, at, at the school and grab, you know, videos that I could watch while I was eating my lunch. I wanted to know everything. You know, I don't know everything. I'm, I'm still learning, but I wanted to know as much as I could coming out of that school. So for anybody out there that, that is going through school right now, please do yourself a favor and just be a sponge and absorb everything that you, you can, you know, uh, learn, learn from, if, if you're not cutting hair, watch somebody that is, you know, stand next to the instructor while that instructor teaches another student is showing another student a skill or something. Because, yeah, don't, don't hang out outside. Yeah, for don't go day. off for that cigarette break or whatever. Yeah, that's a whole nother thing, too. You know, if you're smoking, man, try not to. If you're a smoker, this is a good time to quit. Right. If you're in school, because once you get out there, you know, every time you have to step out for a cigarette, you're you could be losing losing a customer, you know. So, and you might lose the next one that smells your breath. Yeah, that could be too. But but I th I think vaping has kind of helped that a little bit. Oddly enough, I think so. At yeah. very least, with the smell. Yeah, that's true. 
yeah, the smell's a little better, I guess. I go, but, all right, cotton candy, that's a little bit better. Yeah. Anytime I see somebody young smoking, though, you got to remember, I'm an old man now, so I just, hey, be healthy, you know, do what, do what you can for yourself. And hey, if you're a barber, it, it's a good thing to, it's a good habit to quit now because, uh, like I said, if you every time you have to step outside, you could be losing. That's money out of your pocket, I think. And uh, barbers are a frugal people. Yes, absolutely. You have to be. You have to be. Well, and I was so proud that good thing to come out of two months of quarantine is that my youngest barber, who's now 21, quit vaping while she was on quarantine. Oh wow, that's awesome. Good yeah. for her. Man, props to her. That's great. Awesome. Yeah, it's um. Probably not a good habit to have as a barber, I would say. Yeah. Well, when, when you're like 10 inches away from somebody's face for, you know, 20, 30 minutes. Uh, right. If you had coffee, we can smell that. So. Right, right. Yeah, you know, you've you got to have good hygiene. <laughs> That's a whole other thing. We appreciate people sitting in our chair with good hygiene, right? Yes, we so, do. Yeah, and as a barber, you have to. I mean, you really, you, you are representing... Um, not only the shop you're in, but yourself, you're selling yourself and, uh, Hey, you've got to, you've got to look the part and smell the part, right? <laughs> in the most so, selling ourselves in the most honorable sense. That's right. Yes. Yes. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, John, it's been phenomenal talking with you and catching yeah. up. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Very welcome. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. I look forward to, uh, to hearing what's coming forward for you next, yeah, uh, down the pipe yeah. and, uh, we'll be sure to, to look out for you. All right. Thank you.